the possibilities of uncommonalities. Just think about that. What does that even mean? The possibilities and uncommonalities. <laughs> this is not a video game. It's a TV show. And notice, this is like a team. You go into an exploratory place to discover new things. That is what technology development is. You're actually thinking of an idea, and you launch this team off into an adventure to discover something new and be able to deliver it to somebody else. And if you notice from the image, you notice the core team's up front, and they're talking with one another. They're building on something. But then there's me, the guy in the back. <laughs> That's not literally me, but you know what I mean in this metaphor. And the guy in the back is somebody that has a lot of ideas. He doesn't fit in the common culture of the guys up front, but he has ideas that can contribute to the team. If you notice right now, technology, the whole industry is being attacked by, about not being diverse enough. And so what are they going to do? They're going to rush and hire a bunch of minorities, women, uh, other ethnic minorities, gender minorities, gender alignment minorities, and they're going to put them all into the same space and say, hey, we're diverse. We have a whole team of people. But then all the creative decision making is from the core team of the five or six guys that make all the decision for the product. And then their product looks like this. <laughs> a bowl of cereal, very convenient. You just pour it into a bowl, pour some milk on it, eat it, and go about your day. It doesn't have a lot of flavor, and it has very little nutritional value. And that's what we're stuck with in video games. And what I mean by that is, most of your core characters look like this. This is what main characters look like in video games. White men, pale to olive color skin, brown hair, and brown eyes. And everybody wonders, why do we have the same main characters over and over and over again? Because the same group of men, similar, similar backgrounds, similar interests, from music to sports, sit down in a room and say, hmm, what does this character look like? And they stare at each other and say, I got what this character looks like. It looks like one of us. That's what this character looks like. And that's where things start to fall apart, because in America, Black African-American males, 18 to 34, play 30 minutes more of video games than anybody else. Followed by white men, then followed by a Latino group, which is drastically growing faster and faster. And Asians are the last, they're the fourth. But they are the second most recognizable characters in video games as main characters. So, I talked to you about main characters, and this is why that we have the fault of main characters. If you look at the statistics, African Americans, Latinos don't have internet in their house. And that is the foundation. If you're gonna learn anything in modern society, you either go to a library or you go to the internet. And most of us prefer going to the internet, unfortunately. And if they don't use the internet at home, how can they learn to be programmers? How can they learn to be designers? And how can they get comfortable with technology altogether? I was fortunate. I'm from a very uncommon family. We were the first black family in my neighborhood, and I have a brother that's six years older than me. So at age 12, he begged and pleaded my parents for a Commodore VIC-20. And if anybody's on up with the VIC-20 is, it is the most awesome computer ever made, <laughs> and especially when you had the tape drive. So my brother, <laughs> my brother actually piqued my awareness of a computer. I didn't know what a computer was. I was playing with Transformers. But then he turned it on, and I watched him write his first program. And I saw 2 plus 2 equals 4. And I saw it run through, and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. My father, knowing that I always do whatever my big brother does, made a chair for both of us so I can sit next to him and watch him program for hours. <laughs> I guess it killed two birds with one stone or one bench. Um, and my brother told me, hey, if you want to play the games that I'm programming, you have to program with me. And with that, my brother got lazy, and I was one looking at the magazine, punching in all the numbers, and any time there was an error, he'd beat me up. But <laughs> my desire to play video games was instilled into me by my brother, by making me program. And when my brother went to the military, he left another beautiful machine, a Commodore 128. And I had that machine, and I had my hands programming on it. He was in basic training, and I was programming, looking through all the books and magazines. So I took action. And then 
I was the kid that had all the video game consoles. An obscene amount of games sitting around my house, and all my friends would come over and play. So my retention in wanting to make video games actually came from my friends coming over, riding bicycles, hanging out with me, and we're playing video games, and I let them play some of the stuff that I'm making on the computer. But now I'm in the industry, my first job, and I'm the, I'm the minority. I'm the uncommon person in a room. I'm in a room with four other white men that have been doing this for 10 to 15 years. And they're like, hey, why should we hire you? I'm a hard worker. I'm the black stallion. And that's what we have here <laughs> is the black stallion. Like, okay, he's a hard worker. Do we want to take a chance on him? He's very different. He doesn't like the same things we like. You know, we like rock music. We grew up with White Snake, and he likes Public Enemy and rap music. We're so different. And then I told him, I'm a quick learner. It makes me a unicorn. So I can take anything you give me and apply it to myself and actually make it a part of the team. And oh, I also like more than fried chicken. So that made me unique, too. And I was like, I like steak. I like other things. Oh, I do listen to rock music. And then they realized that also I had, a, I've seen Lego collection because I like designing. My first job was in production, and that means I look at a spreadsheet, but then I like designing, and that makes me the alicorn. <laughs> I have multiple skills. I can take up, I can learn a new skill on the fly, and they want to hire that person because that person can be applied anywhere the team needs them. They're the clutch player, as they like to say. And when you look around at black people in technology, most of them are alicorns. You'll find out that it's a programmer that can also do 3D art. It's a 3D artist that does 2D art and animation. It's a tech artist, animator, and a designer. And they have multiple skills. And you ask them why, they say, we have to. To even be considered to be put on the team, we have to have these skills. But it's funny that very few of them are in the, in the meetings that make a decision on if this game is good or not. So what we end up with is they have a person on a team that's either the strongest Jedi in the whole entire galaxy or the coolest guy in the whole entire galaxy, <laughs> and that's all they know about that person. They don't really know much about that person. They just know he does his job. They go, what's up to you? Oh, he's cool. He's cool. <laughs> oh, man, you see what he just did? Yeah, he's powerful. He's badass. He can do that, too. And all you really want to be is just yourself. You want to be just a part of the team, and you want to bring your own personal culture into the team to tell the team how to be creative. Like when they make a, a stereotype character, you know, as the minority, you're like, that's such a bad mood. <laughs> they, they know how this plays out, right? We're going to get backlash on They're like, oh, no, that's how those people are. They really like that. Like, no, they're not. You don't know what you're thinking about. I mean, you just really want to be yourself. And when you make a video game, it's like making a master meal. You know, you spend, you love it for two and a half years to five years, mostly for most video games. And so you have to pick all the right ingredients. And it's easy to go pick up a bowl of cereal, but when you need to pick a team that's diverse and ready, it's like picking the right ingredients. It's like listening to the fruit, filling the fruit, filling the vegetables, staring at the fish to decide which one's the best, which chicken is the best, what else am I going to make with this? And then when you have the master ingredients, you can start working on your meal. But your meal can still be bland, and that's where you don't bring in the diversity of your population, of your team. You don't look for the uncommon things your team has that can share to build in the creative process. And if you did, you recognize those are the herbs and spices. That's everybody's culture. That's their, that's their gender alignment, their gender assignment. That's their ethnic cultures. There's, that's everything, they, all their experiences they carried with them from the past that got them to that point where they're in the room and they have input. They want to say something in the meeting, but they're afraid because they, they're scared to disrupt the culture, what's common amongst everybody. We find, we find comfort in commonality. And what we need to do as leaders is push our people to be more uncommon. What makes this difference? How can we make this better? What is wrong with this? Something's always wrong with something in technology. It's always breaking on us all the time. Even as we're developing, it's like it's broken. The game's broken today, and it's nothing new. It's something that just happens. Our narratives are broken. Our characters are broken. And how do we make them more real? Because technology is just an extension of us. Me saying I'm an iPhone user to a room full of people means something. 
All iPhone users like, yeah, I get it. I'm one of those too. I don't know about those Android people. I don't know what they're thinking. I like it easy. <laughs> but it is an extension. We're, we're cyborgs that way. And we like to say, I like this. The Last of Us is one of my favorite games. And for gamers, that means something to them. And I identify with that. So after I identify with that, and I think about it, we have the cereal again. And that's bland. Everybody can eat it. Everybody take it. It has no personality. It truly has no flavor. It has no nutritional value. It's not something that soothes your soul. It's not something, you don't hear people saying, yeah, I eat cornflakes, man. I eat cornflakes. Man, that Captain Crunch. I'm all about that Captain Crunch. Nobody brags about the cereal they eat. And that's how we look at our technology. Nobody's going to talk about it. It's the same people make it over and over again. It's the same things over and over again, slightly different. But then we have another bowl of gumbo, where you had great gumbo at a restaurant, the first thing you do when you go into the office, man, I went to this gumbo place and the gumbo was delicious, it was awesome. Oh my God, I, had, I brought some home, it's in the freezer right now. And gumbo's a unique dish, because you put things in it, and you take things out, you add more flavor to it. You can throw almost any piece of meat in it if you want to. <laughs> and you cook it, you can eat it cold, you can eat it hot. And that's what we need to look at when we develop things, is am I involving enough people Am I trying to find what makes us all different and trying to incorporate those differences into my product so it resonates with everybody? And that's what we need to constantly be working on, is find out what's uncommon about us and make that part of our community and not the common elements that make us commonly united. And when I speak of alicorns, I want to give a shout out to Gerald Lawson, Jerry Lawson. He is the father of the video game cartridge. He's also the head designer the head engineer, the chief engineer, and head of marketing for Fairchild Semiconductor's video game division. He created the Fairchild Channel F console, which is actually the beginning of the video game era. And with that, with video games, personal computers were able to get more and more powerful because video games demand power. They demand better graphics. And that's why we're capable of having a computer in our phone. The iPhone came around because of apps. And the apps that need to be pushed more power than anything else are video games. So this man, who was definitely an alicorn in the mid-1970s, when there weren't many black engineers, decided to say, hey, not everybody can afford to have a big box in their house to play video games out of, but let me think of this little thing I can put on a cartridge, and they can slide into a machine and make it work. And that's where the video game industry took off. And if it wasn't for him, we might not have Steve Jobs or Steve Wozniak. He was one of the founding members of the Homebrew Computing Society, Computer Club. And they came through that. They were under his tutelage. And we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him to think outside the box. Thank you.